Format didn't he change the team? Absolutely fantastic. So, welcome to redarmy.tv. Right on the back of that Liverpool performance, I hate to say the word defeat, but we were well and truly turned over. In the studio with me, Jamie Garrett, uh, fresh from Australia. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks, and um, Matty Pickover, also from Australia. <laughs> Come on, what's the story there, fellas? When did you go over there? I moved over there about eight years ago. Yeah. It was only supposed to be a short-term thing. As you do. And then never came back. And then, well, Matty and I went to school together, so we've known each other most of our lives. So just because your mate from school went, you had to go too? <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen a couple of pictures on Facebook of him tanning himself, and uh, yeah, I got the backpack on and got over there as well. All right. Well, I've been over there many times. Me, me missus is an Aussie citizen, so I know all, of, oh, I know really? all about Australia. It's yeah. quite a nice place. Um, and uh, you might recognise the guys, I don't know, but these are the guys behind Talking Bollocks, I'd like to say, but it's actually Pollocks, yeah. as in Jamie, who we'll hear from a bit later on. We'll talk more about what you get up to uh, with the old podcast and stuff like that and the blog you never write. We'll, <laughs> we'll get onto that shortly. But we're fresh here from the Liverpool game and uh, a bit of a turning over. I, I was fearing we were going to we get done and, and handsomely. So, Jamie, we'll start with you. What did you make of the match? First half, I thought we did all right. Like, I think we, were, we pretty much matched them. I thought like, like when Mane hit the post in the second half, like, I thought that would have been fairly cruel if, we'd have, if they'd have scored then. Um, Second half, like, I don't know, was it that we were terrible? It just came out the, out the half time, didn't start very well, or was it that they just kind of got a rollicking at half time from Klopp and really turned it on? Probably a bit of both, I think. And then, I don't know, it's almost like they kind of capitalised on a few kind of errors from us in the start of the second half, and then we never really recovered from it, really. But I think they also showed us, Matty, how you can pass the ball and be incisive at the same time and have an end result because they passed us to death and they were pretty dangerous with it, weren't they? They are. Don't get me wrong, they were, they were excellent. And I think certainly their middle three and led by Adam Lailano, they, they were a different class today. Yeah. Well, we, we like to get the ball and pass it around, don't we? We like to starve the opposition of possession. But that's the bloody way to do it. But they're everything we're not, really, aren't they? Like when, we, when we look to string six passes together, we end up going backwards. We go back to our back four and then play it to the other wing. They do exactly the opposite. They're, like, they're actually kind of driving forward, lots of energy, lots of movement, creating chances. They're just everything we're not, really. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose so. How bad a defeat was it in your eyes? Uh, I mean, taking it over the season, I'm not too worried at the end of the day. It's a, it's a game that I didn't expect much from. Uh, I think the next few home games are, are really, really key. Um, so, yeah, overall, it, it's a bad defeat. It doubles our negative goal difference, but we've still got a, a lot better goal difference than the teams below us, so I'm not too worried yet. We can't take too many of them, though, can we? Because that'll soon knacker the goal difference. Of course, but, I mean, I think Crank has come out and said that they're the best team that they've played so far, and they're certainly going to be there or thereabouts. So, yeah, I don't think we were going to get turned over like that very many times this season. Any fear, obviously we're looking at Swansea, we'll look at Swansea in more detail a bit later on, but is there any fear of the hangover from a home defeat like that, a heavy home defeat, might knock the confidence a bit? I'd like to think the opposite, personally. I'd like to think we'll get a reaction out of that. Um, like Mike said, like, realistically, was there too many surprises from today's game? Yes, we wouldn't want to concede three goals at home and lose in that manner, but... We probably we we're probably looking at the next two games as ones that we really need to win. Yeah, interestingly, before the game, um, uh, Eric Perler writing in the Gazette and also Bernie Slaven writing in the Gazette as well basically said the same thing. Perler said we've got to attack. Bernie says we've got to have a go. Did we have a go at Liverpool? Did we really, really have a go at Liverpool? <sighs> Look, I'm not sure it's in Cranker's nature to really have a go, and that's the, probably the painful thing as a Borough fan. Um, we don't really know how to get on the front foot. It always seems to be we'll, we'll contain a team and then hopefully we'll get a nick a goal here or there. So, I, I mean, I think you said before the game, Jay, exactly the same thing. That the, the best way against Liverpool is to attack, just like Bournemouth got at them the other week. But 
Unfortunately, Karanka's stuck in his formation and all he's willing to do is change the players that fit into the formation rather than actually giving, giving us a bit more of an attacking threat by putting more players for, further up the pitch. It's the worst I've actually heard um, the people sitting around me. I'm in the West Stand Up. Uh, uh, people sitting around me having a go at Aito were after the, uh, during the Liverpool game. Particularly, yeah, he made an early substitution, but it was like for like and I think that was angering a lot of people around me. What do you reckon to the, what do you make of the changes? I mean, for me, it was a case of we were struggling to kind of get the ball. We were kind of just chasing them, really, weren't we? And then you look to make a change, and we're bringing on two players in the 30s. And that's the kind of worry for me is that, like, they're, they're, they're moving the ball about, and then we're kind of just chasing channels. And well, the answer is not bringing on Ledbetter in his 30s, Down in his 30s. Ledbetter's not played many games. So it's not really, it's not just the fact that we're not changing the tactics. It's like the personnel that we're actually bringing on. Like realistically, is that the answer? Uh, everyone goes on about the two up front. I mean, we're all probably sick to death talking about it. But we, it, but what is it was, something that could take us down? Having one man up front, having the the lone striker up front, is that something that could take us down? Though. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to do. I mean, today, like as you were saying, Eric Paler, Bernie, everyone was saying we need to attack them, and. Their back four was clearly their weakness. Their back, well, probably the two centre backs. Um, they were obviously without, is it Mapic or Matic, whatever he's called as well. Which, and you kind of looked at the team sheet, you thought, we can maybe have a go at them here. You've got Minilay coming back in for the first time. And you know what, two up front could have been the answer today, but is he ever going to do that? I don't think he is. Is he ever going to do it, do you reckon? I don't think so, unfortunately. I mean, We've spoke about it before that we really would like to see Plan B. Um, there wasn't one, thing, one today, was it? No, wasn't I, a plan the, B today. I think the problem is that Cranker doesn't seem to. Uh, you think in the, going through a week of training that you would you'd tinker with formations, but he, he's so set in his ways, and he, I think he's one of the most stubborn coaches going. I think in that respect, I think the most. Um, but that's for another day. Uh, let's get the take of uh, Joe Nicholson, um, our roving reporter. Here's his take on the match. So, outside the Riverside, following Borough's 3-0 defeat to Liverpool, their heaviest defeat of the season so far, and there was really only one side in it from start to finish. Borough's game plan, as it has been in the past few weeks, was to sit deep, be well organised, be disciplined, and to hit Liverpool on the counter-attack. But as soon as that first goal went in um, from Adam Lallana, when he turned in Nathaniel Klein's cross on at 20 minutes, Borough's game plan really went out of the window. They offered very little going forward and Alvaro Negredo came back into the side today but was really given very little support going forward. Traore, every time he got the ball, there were two, three Liverpool men around him and they really nullified that attack and Borough were very limited in attack today. And by the time the second goal went in, the game was really finished as a contest. A neat finish from Divock Origi in the second half. Liverpool's movement was very good in that second half and by the time the third goal went in from Lallana, um, it was almost like a training exercise for Liverpool, passing the ball around with ease, and Borough allowed them to do so. They're going to have to improve against Swansea on Saturday. Borough, they should do. Uh, Liverpool, very good tonight. Uh, Swansea, with no disrespect, won't be as good on Saturday. But Borough have to improve. They have to show more going forward, um, and they'll have to start at the weekend. Thanks for that, Joe, and also your views as well. Uh, fan rant time. Mark's been out with his magic camera after the game. I don't know how he... How, he's a former para, so he dare do anything. I uh, wouldn't dare myself. Um, and interestingly, he even had the bollocks to stop a Liverpool fan. We'll start with him first and uh, his views of the game. It's the first time I've been to a match for 40 years. <coughs> Excuse me, last time was against Middlesbrough in 1976 and you actually beat us 2 1. So it was a pleasant evening for me. I remember it well. I do, yeah. Poor substitutions. Ledbetter shouldn't have been brought on. Downham was awful when he came on. Um, I thought we played well as a rule. Two second goals were. So the th second and third goal were fantastic, mate. Now we could yeah. do. Tonight's game, disappointing. Because this one went up just after the rebound. Best team won. In the second half, I think they just upped the gear. And we just didn't know that we couldn't, um, we couldn't cope with them. Every time we got the ball, we give it away to them. And when they had the ball, they just played it how they wanted. Played it through us, over us, wide of us. 
So the fans very much um, in the same sort of frame of mind as ourselves, uh, as in not very good. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, not very good was also the Southampton game. I don't know about you were you were back here then. Yeah, you? I was at the game. Yeah, I was I was in Dubai coming back, um, so I had to find a bar. More on that a little bit later on the show. Um, but I'm sitting there with surrounded by my new fans and all the big screens are on, and I got one little tiny screen turned into the Borough match, <laughs> and uh, some United fan got it changed. So I had a bit of a bit of a row. Bit of a standing, me having an argument, but I did. We got it back on. Um, but yeah, Southampton. So the <clears> Liverpool <throat> defeat comes on the back of the Southampton defeat. Uh, what What are your thoughts on on that one? Because that that again was not as at our best, was it? I thought it was worse, to be honest. I thought that was more frustrating um, in terms, particularly the second half performance. I mean, today we're again we're useless in the second half, but I thought the, the second half performance against Southampton was worse. And yeah, I, everyone's frustrated with Itor today, but I was even more frustrated with Itor at Southampton. Um, what was that? Was that bringing that. back? Was that bringing on Triora with nine minutes to go? I mean, I, I just can't believe he was stood on the sideline for the whole of the second half. I just thought he was doing like the mannequin challenge or something. Like he just he just stood there, he didn't move, didn't seem to say anything, didn't seem to look at his bench or anything. And I just don't, I don't know what he's watching half the time. Like. How is he actually thinking? We're not creating anything in that second half. And he just leaves, it's not even the same tactics, but just leaves the same team on the pitch when we clearly don't look like scoring. That was probably the most frustrating point of the season for me, that second half. You mentioned, I don't know which, who, which was, it, was it you, Matt, you mentioned the word stubborn. Yes. Um, the fans were singing for about 25 minutes for Triori to be brought on before he was, but with nine minutes to go, um, does it leave you as frustrated as it does me? Oh, Frustration is definitely the word, but it's not the first time, is it? Karanka seems to do it time and time again, where he, he doesn't give the, the substitutes enough time to influence games. And I think Troy was the only sub he brought on, but when you're one goal down, for me, you've got to bring two, if not all three, subs on and try and change things. And that was the frustrating thing was that was a game we could have easily got a point or three from because Southampton weren't that good on the day. Mm. Um, what, what I couldn't get my head around was... His reaction after the game, before the Liverpool game, when he was when he was asked in the press conference about Triore, and he was he was saying, "I'm here to win games. I'm not here to watch Triore highlight show." Yeah. What sort of comments are that from your manager? I don't understand. Can you understand where he's? Maybe it was a bit of an English Spanish mistranslation somewhere. But where was he going with that? Do you know? I think he, I think he's he's obviously heard the kind of the chance from the fans. Well, even if he didn't hear, it was obviously brought up. I know by like the Gazette in their interviews with him. So I think he's just again just kind of just being stubborn and trying to just prove a point because he knows what the kind of the general reaction from the fans is on T side and he's almost because he came out as well and like it wasn't just that he was defending Stuani as well. Like he come up with all these ridiculous stats about Stuani, which. I, don't know, I think it was defending him's decision when he knows what the people on T side are actually thinking. Mm. And I don't know, maybe was he? We don't know. We don't still don't really know what happened to Suarez tonight. Like, he wasn't even on the bench. Um, was he yeah, injured was or not? Like, or was it mind games? Was he just trying to make everyone think, including Liverpool probably, uh, that Triore wasn't going to play, and then he throws him in as like to try and surprise him? I don't know. Who knows what he's thinking? He's got to submit his team sheet an hour before kickoff, so I'm sure they'll find out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not just going to, oh, who's that on the pitch lining up against us? Um, punditry, quick question on punditry because it has been raised. Um, Alan Shearer was not too kind uh, about the borough, saying uh, he fears for Shock. us. Shock horror. Um, uh, Neville wasn't too bad, saying he didn't think we'd, we'd go down, but that's probably about as good as we've got so far. Lawrence and uh, it's changing, you know. He was saying, "Oh, they're going to be all right in early doors," and, and now even he's questioning the borough. Yeah. Are we are we too sensitive? Do we just pick up on what we want to hear when it comes to pundits on the telly and the radio and stuff talking about the borough? <laughs> yeah, look, I, it doesn't bother me in the slightest that she says that we're going to go down. To be honest, uh, I was more disappointed with with the international uh, side of things. Schwartz is a, a pundit, and yeah. before the season started, he, he had us going down, which I was really positive before the season. I thought we we obviously recruited quite well, but. Um, right now, I'm not sure. Not so sure. You're not sure we're staying in the Premier League. Oh, look, we, we're, the, we're the lowest scorers, <laughs> and, and we're really struggling to win win a game at the end of the day. But I think, I think the, probably the next six games to the end of January, we'll, I, I reckon we'll know by then where we're yeah. going where we're going to end up. It's a common question we've been asking on the show. Are we in a relegation scrap already? Oh, we're definitely in a scrap. Yeah, I mean, I think we. It's inevitable we're going to be in a. 
maybe scrap isn't, <laughs> isn't <laughs> quite the right word, but it it we're, is, defi- it we're definitely definitely always going to be looking over our shoulder. If we're not in that bottom three, we're going to be looking over our shoulder at the time. And I mean, with the, the pundits, like, when they're watching one of our games, they're analysing one of our games. I mean, let's be honest, we don't really excite very much, do yeah. they? So it's probably just like a and bit of a knee jerk reaction is to think, oh, actually, they're basing it on one game a lot of the time. And most of the time, we're not that particularly exciting. Like, and they were we probably were, saying something different a few weeks and ago. And we were dreadful in the first half at City as well. I think we had a good Ian right over that one, even though he was pretty accurate, saying terrible <laughs> yeah. four times, Ian. Right, um, we're going to move on. We've got to talk about Hull, actually, because uh, we all were smitten with some. Devil disease uh, in the past week uh, here on Red Army, so we haven't touched on Hull, so we'll touch on that briefly. But uh, not until we've heard from Chris Story, who's got the latest on the Red Army news. Fancy a job at the borough? Hospitality stewards are needed to help manage both matches and other events. G4S, who the club uses to steward games at the Riverside, are looking for locals to join the company on a casual basis. More details can be found via the web at careers.g4s.com. Borough midfielder Adam Forshaw has crowned the King's Academy as the MFC Foundation representative in the Premier League's Enterprise Challenge. Five schools entered the national competition that Borough won back in 2012. The school kids used the football business to inspire themselves into becoming young entrepreneurs. And it's back. Borough fans who love collecting stickers of their favourite stars can from today revisit the past. Premier League football means Borough are now in the Merlin sticker collections for the new season. The books and sticker packs hit shelves today. It's seven years since Borough last featured in a collection set. And if you have any Borough-related news, just send it to us here at redarmy.tv. You can email it to studio at redarmy.tv or send it via social media at Borough Red Army. Uh, Hull City, fellas, we said we'd touch on it very briefly. Seems an awful long time ago since yeah. we picked up the three points, doesn't it? It does. Uh, I, I guess there's one thing that we haven't mentioned is, is Gaston Ramirez. I, I think he is our key player at the moment and he mm. was very good against Hull and he led us um, and he, obviously we've missed him the last couple of games with his injury. Mm. Um, was that all about the three points? Because we didn't tear them apart, which I'd hoped we would have gone for the throat, but was it just about getting three points? Yeah, it was. It, we deserved to win, I thought. Um, I mean, when I, we talked about it on the podcast, I said, the whole thing just felt like a relief, didn't it? Like, when we scored, it felt like, it wasn't like the normal kind of excitement when we scored, it was almost like a bit of a relief. Like, oh, thank God, we've actually got that goal now. Because once we went 1-0 up, apart from the last few minutes, like, we looked fairly comfortable. Like I said, they also were attacking us in the last few minutes. So when that final whistle went, it was just a relief because that game was probably the, the one game of the whole season where it was a must win. Like. Every other game, you can, kind of, you can kind of make an argument, okay, we've picked up a draw, we've lost. But that one game against Hull, it was like a must win. So it was just a relief just to get it out of the way and get the three points. So how are you going to be on Saturday? Just, I think everyone... It would... could come off the referee's backside and go in and it would be the scrappiest performance ever. But if we win against Swansea, that's all that matters. Is, is, is that how you're approaching it? Without a doubt. And I think, I think that's probably how Crank views his season. He, he looks at these... Games like beating Bournemouth, beating Hull, and they're the games that he really, really focuses on for, for our three points. Well, let's hope Triori gets on the score sheet. That's if he gets a game. Uh, the reason why I'm talking, Triori, you mentioned the podcast. Yeah. And I was on the Facebook page uh, a little earlier before the <laughs> Liverpool game, and there's a certain song on there. Yeah. What's all this? Do you record these out there, or have you been recording them over here? <laughs> we all like quite like songs, and then we just a few times we just sit there together and we try and like think of like new songs. And we've come up with one for Triore. We came up with one for Mr. the Fisher. Know? Oh, Fisher, yeah. Did you hear the Fisher one? I did see the Fisher one, yeah, yeah. but it's the Triore one we've pulled off. <laughs> so um, for some reason, we just decided to do it in the car once. Yeah, a bit, bit like James Corden, I guess, with his... Uh, instead of it's karaoke. Yeah. a carpool karaoke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they do sing. Have a listen to this. <laughs> go down, Mary, burning up the riverside. Triore, go Triore. Go down, Mary, their defence is terrified. Triore, go Triore. He's got one trick. He's proper quick. Triore. It's Triore. Go, 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 go. <laughs> So, fellas, so where did the uh, creativity come then for the uh, Triore song? I can't re- I think it was like the first, it was, it was after the Arsenal game, wasn't it? And I think we were all just on that high with the first game when he came in. And 
I don't know how it, I don't know where it, it came from. To be whose honest. idea was it? <laughs> well, it? It ended up being a combination of all four of us. Uh, I think Russ picked picked which song we could sing, and then yeah, between us we managed to mumble some lyrics together, and yeah. Are they going to continue as the season continues? <laughs> we'll try. Can we see more? Can we show more and more? We'll try and things some more. We'll try and make it like a regular feature. Okay, we've got to wait for the sunshine and the warm temperatures, obviously. Well, yeah, it was... to, to bring out the best of your creativity. Is that what it is? Yeah, we've got to... beer and sunshine. We've got to have a nice tan and everything and everything before... While we're on the camera, we want to look good if we're going to be on the camera as well. We normally hide behind it with a podcast this and just is, this, the mic. Is this, is this why the Matt Goss sort of hairstyle? Is it? Uh, <laughs> is it, is it, it was. It was revisited. It was a bit blustery by the oh, right, by okay. the riverside, wasn't oh, right, it? Okay. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about the uh, the podcast. How where did, where did the idea come from? Well, I mean, Jay kind of hosts it, and it, I think he spoke spoke with one of the other lads, Jordan, and uh, he's certainly not shy in coming forward ever. So. Uh, they, those two first had a chat, and then yeah, they, they brought me in as a bit of a stats man, I guess. Uh, about, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Or yeah. Matto, as I'm, I'm now known. But uh, <laughs> not that I live and die by them, but I certainly like like my stats. Like so. A good stat. So yeah, um, and then Russ was another guy who, who's who's from our school, who's recently come back to Australia, and uh, yeah, if you ever hear any impression. On there, that's that's him giving it a go. All right, so the four of his round. Yeah, and, and do you literally sit round one mic? Is that all you've got? You can only afford one. <laughs> yeah, no, it does okay. sit there on the side. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, four Borough fans and a mic. Well, we'll we, we do want to invest in better technology, but we're kind of like yeah, we're kind of just make trying to make a case for it first and oh, see right, how okay. things go. And we're going to justify it to our girlfriends. Well, we'll keep we'll keep dipping into it every now and again, see what you're coming up with, and we'll give you we'll give you a bit of a plug. Don't yeah. worry. Um, just a quick one. We're going to catch up with Jamie Pollock because it was a night with Pollock uh, a couple of Fridays ago. Uh, we did promise you a little bit. Interestingly, I asked him the question about Janino and what was it like to play with Janino. You might be rather interested with what, what Jamie had to say about the little fella. What I found was we had a balance when we went to Premiership, and at Christmas we actually went to Everton. And if we'd have won, we'd have gone second in the league. Mm. And we had a balance where we had me and Robbie Musso who were doing a lot of work, and we had um, Iggy on the left and Barnes on the right, and that gave us a, a structure to work from. And we had Big Yanfield off up front. And what we lost when we took Iggy out and we put Janino in with a ball. We were a lot more forceful, but without the ball, we were very weak. And we started to lose games, and not, not because of Janino, but because the team shape had changed. And Janino was absolutely brilliant with the ball. Super running past people, skipping past people. His end product wasn't fantastic. And I'll be honest with you, I mean, I'm going to be a little bit controversial, but I do believe that we've had better players with more effect, but Middlesbrough, made Janino a god mm. and that's where he stays. Who would you who would you rate then as the players who've been in and had better effect? Nick Bambi was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable as a footballer and he showed that when he went on. I mean, you know, he played against your Barcelona's, played against Germany when England won five one scored. He was absolutely superb and he worked. Now don't get me wrong, I sound like I'm criticizing Janino as a footballer he was outstanding. And what he could do was entertain crowds, but sometimes we had to win games, and we actually had to go to Leeds United, and we had to drop Janino to dig out the result, because we went boom, like that. And although he came to the club, and he lifted the club, and he lifted the fans, but in the team, and in the dressing room, that work and spirit was broken. And it became very hard to win games, and people knew, and we started the struggle. So take us inside the dressing room then. You've got Janinho, who was the young player of the year in Brazil, and you're getting to this point where you start to take him out of games because the balance wasn't right. I mean, what's it like from a player's perspective in the dressing room at that point? Are you saying, yeah, Gaffer, we agree? He's got to come out, or what? what? It's not our job. We, you know, we, we go on, you know, at the end of the day, the Gaffer picks the team and we'll play whoever's on the game. You know, it, it's not us to, to question the Gaffer's decisions. But you must have your own opinions in there. Well, our opinion was quite simple. We needed to toughen up and we needed to become harder to beat. And once we did that, we scraped the points to survive. But the following year, when I actually I moved on, but yeah. the following year the club got relegated for that same thing. Because in football, you've got to realise that you spend as much time without the ball as you do with the ball. And if you talk to me about players who played for Middlesbrough Football Club who were absolutely magnificent and you won things on, more than you know, 
was Nigel Pearson. He was an unbelievable leader. He would put himself, I mean, he's an absolute crackpot, right? He's an, he's an absolute leader. But I tell you what, when you looked round in the change room and you see Nigel Pearson and you were about to walk out at Tottenham away or Stoke away, you always felt you could win the game. So, interesting one. We'll leave that uh, for you to chew the cut over, whether uh, Janino was the best player for the Borough or not. He reckons Nigel Pearson had more of an impact for the Borough than Janino. But that's all, Jamie. He doesn't, doesn't hold back. <laughs> we have the small matter, fellas, of Swansea on our doorstep. Yeah. Uh, we talked about Hull earlier. Uh, what do you want from it? Is it just three points, please, or do you want... Us to take them apart? Do you want a decent performance? Oh, it's just definitely just three points. I don't care. I mean, you would if you'd have looked at this even a couple of weeks ago, you'd have been targeting this as a three points. Um, particularly after the last two games as well, there's quite a bit of negativity that's creeped in again with the Southampton performance. And I imagine over the next two days, people in Teesside aren't going to be happy with the Liverpool performance. So we just need to get. I say a positive win, just any kind of win, really, just to get the three points. Do we not need a, a decent performance, though? Do we not want to show that we can tear somebody apart? Oh, down the line, I'm happy to, to do that right now, but it, it is at the point where we, we need to get that fourth we're win. We're not even season. at Christmas and we're talking about, please, just give us a win. But I, don't, I just don't see us capable of really tearing someone apart, to be honest. Particularly with, I don't know if Gaston's going to be back for the... Uh, for the Swansea game, I don't know how long he's going to be out for, but with him not on the pitch, like, do you really see us being able to tear someone apart? I, I don't see where I'd it's like going to come to from. I'd like to think we can see us tearing somebody apart, but we haven't shown any signs of it yet this season, have we? No, and I, I think he's going to. If he's not going to change the formation, then, like I say, we need we need to break the three in the middle up and, and maybe play Downing in that three as someone who's, who can pick a pass and and actually can shoot because. Those three between them, I don't think will hit, hit the target all season. Mm. Mm. Well, they've got the man who says Baton in charge of them, haven't they? Now, Bob Bradley, the American <laughs> leading the Swans, American owned club. It's becoming a real United <clears throat> States of Swansea land down there. Yeah. Um, hopefully, he'll continue with his losing streak um, because, <sighs> heaven forbid, if we don't win the game, what's, what, what's the reaction of the fans going to be? Like, yeah, like you say, you really, I mean, one of the things, certainly watching from afar, the the, uh, the atmosphere in the stadium has been brilliant for, for most of the season. Uh, e even wet during the games when we've performed poorly at home. So, yeah, we really need to stick together, I think. And that's the worry. If you, if you do get a, a defeat against someone like Swansea, that you, you really will start hearing the, uh, the fans' yeah. negativity. Time to stick the neck out. What's your prediction? Um... Yeah, I think I'll, be, I'll go with a 1-0. <laughs> Jamie? 5-0. No, no. Hey. <laughs> no, realistically, you're probably just going to expect us to... I think it'll be, it's, it's going to be quite tight, isn't it? Uh, I'll go 1-0 for one the Borough. 1-0. <laughs> I think we predict 1-0 all the time, to be honest. But it, it is at the moment. It's I, a good scoreline, isn't it? I try to stay positive, right? I say I'm winning, and then 1-0 always just creeps in. Well, I'm going to double it. I'm going to go for 2-0. So. Who's going to score? Who's going to score? Ben Gibson's going to leap like a gazette at the back post corner. <laughs> Bang. Thank you very much. That's 1-0. And Gaston will be back and score the second. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed. I don't care back. who scores. It can be two on goals for me as long as we get the points. Fellas, thank you very much. Wish you well for your stay over the festive period. Thanks for having us. trip back. Yeah, thank you uh, we much. look forward to seeing those pictures from bloody sunny, warm Sydney. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Highly envious we are. We'll catch you next week. Hopefully on the back of three points from Swansea and a decent performance. Catch you then. Come on, lads, believe. Come on.